This morning we are especially privileged to have a, sort of a local person. Uh, pastor Mike Chapman has been the pastor at City Church in Chattanooga for 40 years. He just sort of backed away and he gave that over to his son. Shannon is here actually with him today. And so it's good to have Shannon as, as well with us. And of course, Pastor Chapman's been married to Trudy and they have Shannon and they have six grandkids. You're doing a good job, Shannon. Amen. He has been in ministry basically all of his life. He came to Lee University from South Carolina a number of years ago, about uh, three or four, I think, when he graduated from Lee University about that many years ago. He has uh, pastored in California, also in Hawaii. That was a tough time in his life, but uh, the Lord called him there. And then God called him back to Chattanooga. He has been a strength and a huge blessing to the Chattanooga and local area. He's a pastor. He's a teacher. He's a man of God. He's currently doing some work in church revitalization uh, with churches throughout the state of Tennessee. But he is a friend to Lee University, and he is a wonderful man of God. Pastor Mike Chapman, would you help me welcome him this morning? Good morning, everyone. It's a delight to be here. It's always exciting to come to this campus where there's so much energy, where there's so much dynamic things happening, and it's just a thrill and a, and a delight to be with you. Uh, I'm a little bit hoarse. I'm coming off of four weeks of pneumonia, but uh, the Lord's given me grace to uh, share, and I'm, I believe he has a message he wants us to share together. Now, I was here at, on this campus back at the time dinosaurs were roaming the earth. That's how far ago it was when I was here. But it had a great impact on who I am today. Uh, I, hear, I remember once hearing a story of a professor of philosophy at a university who came into the university and went to the board and he wrote the word why. And after writing the word why, he turned back to the class and said, for the rest of this class period, the rest of the 50 minutes, I would like you to write a response to that question. And, and when you're finished, you can come and place it on my desk. I'm leaving. I'll come back at the end of class and pick it up. And whenever you're finished, you can leave. He walked out of the class. Students were looking there, pondering and thinking about why, why, how do we write a paper on this? How do I write a reflection paper on this? And some began to feverishly write. After about five minutes, the first student turned in his paper and laid it on the desk and walked out. Everyone looked at him and thought to themselves, man, he must have had a mental block. He couldn't think of anything and he's going to get a poor grade. Finally, at the end of the class, students began to bring them, put them up, and the professor came back after class, picked them up to grade. At the next class period, he said, you wrote some, many, many of you wrote some very interesting and insightful things, but let me tell you what I think was the best paper. And he read the name of the student, and everybody thought, my word, that's the guy who put it in after two minutes. And he said, here's the best answer. It was a one-word answer, because. That was the answer. He only wrote one question, why, and the answer was, because. Today I want to talk to you about a why question that needs an answer. You see, human beings have questions just because of how God created us. We have questions. We have hard questions. Human beings have the ability to reflect. No other creature God created has the ability to reflect and think through. None at all. I know some of you have cats, and you think your cat is sitting over there doing deep reflection. I promise you the cat is either asleep or thinking about a mouse, nothing else. Human beings are the only creatures who are aware of their own mortality. No other animal, no other creature is aware of their own mortality, that their life will end. We know ours will. And that affects the way we ask questions. And so today, what I want to talk to you about is why am I here? And that's your question. Why am I here? You see, there was a man in the Bible. We don't know exactly who he was. Some say it was Solomon, but whoever it was, he wrote a book called Ecclesiastes, obviously at a midlife crisis of his life where he was pondering all kinds of questions. 
And this is how he began his book in, in chapter one. He said this, everything is meaningless, says the teacher, completely meaningless. Now he referred to himself as a teacher because he wanted to teach particularly a rising generation, some of his own experiences, some of his own frustrations, and what he had learned and the conclusion he had come to. So it begins like this. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, but hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south, then it turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. The waters return again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. History merely repeats itself. It, it has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is new. He says, sometimes people say, here's something new, but actually it's old. Nothing is ever truly new. We don't remember what happened in the past, and in future generations, no one will remember what we're doing now. I think he was having a no good, very bad day. He was starting out saying, this is how I started this journey, and I'm going to write the journey and what I process. When you look at this, you see someone who's obviously very discontent, who feels, sense, uh, who feels strong sense of meaninglessness, futility, insignificance, and emptiness. What he's really saying, it seems like life has no ultimate purpose. And so what I want to ask you is, do you understand the purpose? Do I understand the purpose? You see, to find meaning, to find purpose, you've got to discover, first of all, origin. The first fundamental question of any worldview is not, why am I here? The first fundamental question is, where did I come from? Because if you can't answer that question, the next one absolutely is unanswerable because it's directly tied together. Why am I here? What is my purpose? What's the meaning of my life? Well, you've got to go back to a previous question to answer that question, and that question is the question of origin. That question is the question, where did I come from? Now, when you look at that first question, there are really only two possible answers. Now, you can break these answers down in subpoints, but two general categories. Where did I come from? Where did I, as a part of the human race, come from? We can answer it this way. I either came from God or I didn't. That's pretty much the two categories. Now, you can give all kind of subpoints under that, but let's put it like this, either from God or not from God. Either there's a theistic answer, I came from God, or there's a non-theistic answer, I did not come from God. And if there is no God behind everything that exists, and particularly the human race, which includes you and me, if there is no God behind that, then what is the answer? Because everything that exists, if there is no God, is simply a random, pointless coincidence. That we have decided, most scientists have decided, that the best answer is there was a big bang, and out of that there came this rising evolution that continues until this day. But there was nothing before that. There was absolutely no purpose, no plan, no design. It just happened. Coincidentally, it just happened. I want you to think about that just for a moment. If that is the answer, then what then is the answer to the next question? Okay, everything just happened with no purpose, no design, nothing. Coincidentally, it was accidental. It was just a big cosmic accident. Boom! That's all. Then the second question, why am I here, has no answer. There's no purpose behind you. You have no purpose. A very brilliant man, but a very strong atheist who lived at the crossover between the 19th and 20th century from Germany was Friedrich Nietzsche. Friedrich Nietzsche was the first man who coined the phrase, God is dead. 
Now, he didn't mean there was a literal physical God who had died. He said God was a great superstition, the most noble superstition the world has ever had, the greatest idea. He said, but God is dead. Because we have become so smart in our intellectual development that we don't need God to answer the unanswerables anymore. We figured everything out. We can answer every mysterious question. We've killed God. Here's what he said. God is dead. We have killed him. You and I. With what kind of sponge did we wipe away an entire horizon? And we have killed him. He's dead. He remains dead. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderer, murderers of all murderers? He said, we've killed God. We've killed God off. We don't need God anymore. He said, there's no purpose to believe in him. He never really existed, but it was a great idea, wasn't it? But we've taken care of him. Now, the reason I say Nietzsche was a very brilliant man, because he understood the implications of what he was saying. The implication was, we have been now cut loose like a ship from its moorings. We are free-floating out in life. There's no purpose. Every man can do whatever's right in his own eyes. He predicted that this theory of his would be broadly accepted as it moved into the 20th century, and it was in Western Europe. Hitler was a student of Nietzsche. Stalin was a student of Nietzsche. And here's what Nietzsche said. The 20th century will be the bloodiest century in the history of humanity. He said, power will rule. Whoever has the greatest power has the ability to wipe out thousands of people. You know, he was absolutely right. Because if you remove God from the beginning, life then has no purpose. So the next question is, how should I live? Any way you want to. And we're still in that today, are we not? Any way you want to. Because if there's no meaning, there's no morality. I heard a person say, an atheist say, that's not true. You can have morality without meaning. He said, really? Can you really? Can you have a sense of right and wrong in ethics? He said, I want to ask you a question, sir. If you were walking down a street late at night, very late at night, and you were the only person on the street, and you suddenly heard step, uh, footsteps of a group of people walking behind you, would it give you any consolation to know they were coming from a late night Bible study? And the man smiled and he said, well, probably. He said, so there is a connection between meaning and morality, isn't there? He said, why are you talking about this today, Pastor? Because I remember my second semester at Lee when I, a Bible and theology major, or a preacher guy coming, you know, here to Lee as a young guy, started to doubt everything. I was reaching, and I'm thinking, I don't know if I believe any of this anymore. I don't want to go into all the, I ain't got time to go into all the reasons why I got there, but I was there. And for about a year, I silently struggled, continued to go to my Bible classes, my theology classes, church history classes, making A's all the way through, but lying in my dorm room, looking up at the ceiling, thinking, I don't know if I believe this. Maybe we just want to believe it so badly, we don't want to even stop and question. Maybe it's not true. We just want to believe it. And I remember that. And I struggled for that for about a year. I'll tell you more about that later. In the early 1990s, I had the opportunity to go to the Ukraine and speak in the leadership project that was there. Communism had fallen. The atheistic, communistic view had failed them. And there were some Christian leaders in the United States who wanted to go to the Ukraine, to Kiev, and speak to university students, setting up programs, helping them understand what is Christianity about, what is a Christian worldview. And somehow I got in that mix. I do not know how because I looked around at some of the people and I said, I'm way over my head. We had, a, we had a couple of American astronauts who were Christians who taught uh, bank, uh, uh, investment bankers who were Christians. People were sitting there, and they asked me to come and teach a Christian worldview. I said, okay, here, we're going to give it our best shot. And I remember asking this question. I had about 60 students, university students. About 20 of them had already become Christians. The rest were seeking and searching. And I asked this question under the communist worldview, what were you told your purpose was, that you had a purpose. What is your purpose? It was the longest silence of any classroom question I've ever asked, and I determined I would not say another word until someone answered it. And I waited, and I waited, and I waited, and finally, 
And they were not just sitting there, by the way. You could see they were thinking, what, what were we told our purpose was? Finally, one young man raised his hand, and through the interpreter, he basically said, to serve the state. And everybody looked and said, da, da, that's yes in Russian. And they said, that's it, that's it right there. I said, to serve the state? That's your ultimate purpose? said, yes, that's the purpose of every human, to serve the state. And I looked at them and I said, is that a satisfying answer to you? And everybody said, net. And I said, let me talk to you about a Christian worldview and what Christianity says your purpose is. I'll talk to you more about that now. You see, I believe the presupposition of my life is that there is a God. I am a Christian. I finally reached that point after a year of struggling, and I said, there is a God, and He is the reason for my existence. And what happened to me in that time was that one of my classes had a textbook. It was called Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. At that time, I had a vague idea of whoever C.S. Lewis was. I mean, I'm just a, you know, undergrad starting off from South Carolina. We, didn't, we never talked about C.S. Lewis in church. And, but I began to read this book by this guy, and it turned me around, and it made me understand that there is indeed a God in heaven, and He has determined a purpose for my life and your life. And I remember that. And so this is my presumption that I present to you today. It's found in two verses of the Bible. It's real simple. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. That behind all of this, there is a God. And because there is a God behind it, there is a purpose behind it. And then I love what Paul wrote to a small village in what would today be Turkey. Paul, one of the early followers of Christ who once hated Christ, wrote this. He said in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. He was there before any of it came into existence, and he holds it all together right up to this moment. What is he saying? Behind it all, there is a God. So when the why question comes, the because answer was already in place. There is a God. And from that, we discover our purpose. So here's what we begin to understand. The answer to the question, why am I here, does not begin with me, does not begin with you. It begins with God. If there is no God, life be quickly becomes absurd. We are like dogs chasing our tail. If there is no God, life is absurd. Uh, Brian McLaren said this in his book, Finding Faith. If there is no God, life... No, he said the universe is just, uh, is just stuff thrown out into space and time going nowhere, meaning nothing, like ran random noise echoing like gibberish, like nonsense words spoken to nobody, to nobody with no intent, if there is no God. Tolstoy said, you are simply a little lump of something randomly stuck together. The lump decomposes and the lump falls apart, and thus the decompo decompo decomposition ends, as do all your questions. They will decompose with you. There are no answers to your questions if there is no God. So if there is no God, life quickly becomes absurd. So what does God have to say about those questions? Why am I here? Albert Einstein, I don't know about you, but he is the poster boy for genius. The, you know, the bushy hair, the bushy mustache, the, I mean, genius. And there's been a lot of arguments over the years. Was he a theist or a non-theist? I said, according to which quote you saw. Sometimes he wrote like a theist. Sometimes he wrote like a person who didn't believe in God. But I like this quote that he had. He said, God doesn't roll dice. God doesn't roll dice. What he's saying is when God does something, he does something on purpose for a purpose. That wasn't saying he wasn't a gambler. It meant that God has a purpose. God works on purpose for a purpose. Proverbs 16.4 says this, the Lord has made everything for his own purpose. And hey, you and I are in the word everything. God has made you for his purpose. So what is it? I'd like to share with you what I see in the Bible God says about why you're here and what your purpose is. 
and that true happiness will never be found until I align myself with that purpose. Here's the first one. God has told us our purpose is to know him. God wants us to know him. Paul, again, writing not just to a little village, but this time to a major metropolis in Asia, Asia Minor. He said in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, listen to this. Listen to this carefully. Look at it on the screen. Long before he laid down the earth's foundations, God had us in mind. And he settled on us as the focus of his love. Do you know what that says? Your purpose is to receive the love of God. God created you to love you. He created you as far back in the balcony as you can go so he could love you. So I know what it's like to hide out in chapel and say, listen to the preacher and say, I don't know if I believe this or not. I wanted to believe, but I had so many questions I needed to find answers for. He, he said he made us the focus of his love. God created us to love us and to have a relationship with us. God did not create us because we were lonely. I've heard people say, well, God was sitting up there in heaven. He kind of got bored. He got bored. There was nothing but him, just God. And he kind of got bored, and, he's, and he was lonely. I want you to understand something. God has never been alone one time. Say, wait a minute now, there's only God. God has never been alone. Even when there was just God, nothing had been created. Time had not been created. God has never been alone. In the mystery of a theological concept called the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, there are not three gods, but somehow mysteriously within this one divine being, there's a Father, Son, Holy Spirit that exists. Now, I can't fully explain that, fathom it. I've told people, if you, if you try to figure out the Trinity, you'll lose your mind, but if you deny it, you'll lose your faith. So I'm going to stick with my faith. This is how it's revealed in Holy Scripture. So that means this. When God has only been God all by himself, he has never been alone. God has never been lonely. Because of the love and the relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God has never been alone. So he didn't create you because he said, gee, I'm getting bored. It's lonely up here. I'm going to create something. No, it has nothing to do with that. In fact, Meister Eckhart, one of the uh, Middle Ages... Uh, German theologian said this, we were created not out of the loneliness of the Trinity, the loneliness of God, but out of the laughter of the Trinity, out of the joy of the Trinity, who experienced love among themselves, said, let's love more. You were created to be loved by God and to have a relationship with him. We were created to glorify him. God said that. We were created in his image to reflect his image. Ephesians 1.12 says we were chosen so that we would bring praise to God's glory. Paul tells us, and I like the message version of this passage in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, one of the ways we do this. Paul, the message says this, so here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, writing papers, sitting through classroom, going to a ball game, walking around life, I added a few things, and place it before God as an offering that he may be glorified in every aspect of your life, that he may be reflected in you. You were created. Your purpose is to know God, to glorify God. And our friends from the Reformed tradition says to enjoy God. God wants you to enjoy him. Some people have the wrong view of God. God wants you to enjoy. Paul, again, said in one place, he said, God has given us everything richly to enjoy. Jesus said in John 10, 10, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. God says, I want you to enjoy 
my love. I want you to enjoy your purpose. Now, so far, I've given you three sentences. God wants you to know him. God wants you to, uh, to glorify him. God wants you to enjoy him. The last one is not a sentence. It's an adjective. And it's the word forever. The Westminster Catechism said, what is the chief end of man? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. This is not a temporary purpose of your life. This is an eternal purpose of your life that God calls you to. And he had you in mind from beginning to end. This is why Ephesians 1.10 says this. This was his purpose. When the time is ready, he will gather all of us together from wherever we are to be with him in Christ forever. Forever. Forever is forever, guys. It's forever. That's your purpose, that your future will forever be with God. I remember reading something C.S. Lewis wrote, and this was in that time while I was here struggling, but I was beginning to come out of that struggle. C.S. Lewis wrote this, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation was that I was made for another world. There are things that God yet has to fulfill your purpose that you will never be fulfilled in this life until you're in that one. Now, if there is no God, life is absurd. Frustratingly so. So the question, why am I here, finds its ultimate answer in a relationship with God. Their answer boils down to this, that if I'm going to find my purpose, i got to get to know God. It's that simple. Because all other pursuits will fail. If I'm going to find my purpose, I've got to connect with God. Because he's the one that gave me that purpose in the manner in which I came into this world. Now, Jesus made a very bold and very audacious claim when in John 14, just a few hours before his crucifixion, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And then he said this, if you really knew me, you would know my Father too. So how do we connect with God? The entree to God is Jesus, who is the Son of God. Our relationship with Jesus introduces us into an eternal relationship with God. There is no other way. It's not trying to turn over a new leaf. It's not trying to be better. All those things are great, self-help and good. But the whole bottom line is we've got to connect with Jesus, and Jesus came to make that possible. When God said he poured out his love on us, we were the object of his love. That love took his son all the way to the cross so that God can have a relationship with you and me. That's what it boils down to that he can have a relationship with us. So why am I here? I'm here to know God, glorify God, enjoy God forever. And that occurs when I meet him through Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. Let's go back to Ecclesiastes where we started. He started off frustrated, saying everything's meaningless. But the teacher, through his journey, came to a conclusion. And he offers this answer 
to you? The answer is found at the end of Ecclesiastes, the very last chapter, chapter 12, verse 1. And here's what he said. And so, we come to the end of this musing over my life. My advice to you is don't forget your Creator. Connect to God, your Creator. Interesting. He could have chosen all kinds of terms to refer to God here. He could have said, don't forget Almighty God. Don't forget the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. But he chose the word creator. Because he had eventually come to the conclusion, if I'm going to figure out what the meaning of life is, if I'm going to figure out what my purpose is, i got to go back to the first question. Where did I come from? There is a creator. And in him you will discover your purpose. Because you are not a coincidence. You are not a cosmic orphan. You are not simply some cosmic accident that happened. You just happened. The human race is just here by some, some fluke. There's no real reason behind it. He said, here what I want you to know. While you're still young, he was writing to people just like you in this auditorium. He says, don't wait till you get old like me and figure it out. Start now. He said, don't forget your creation. Creator, connect with him because in him you will discover your purpose. Amen. That's where it's at. And I was wondering when I was preparing this sermon, because I'm one of these people who like to kind of ask God, uh, what should I preach? And I can't promise you every time I've hit that right. And it's bad to preach a message God didn't want you to preach because you don't feel any anointing. Have you ever listened to an unanointed sermon? It's awful, isn't it? Let me tell you what's worse, preaching one. It's worse than listening to one. It's almost like you see Jesus sitting on the front row looking at you just like your city, sir, like this. Smiling, saying, you wrote this one on your own. You're on your own. I don't feel that way right now. Because hidden in this auditorium is somebody who's questioning it all and wondering, am I on the right track here? God sent me here to tell you that he has a purpose for you. And he came and told me to tell you, don't forget your creator. Don't ignore him because it is in him you will discover your purpose. If there is no God, life is a bad joke. But if what the Bible says is true, that you are here on purpose for a purpose, God wants to lead you into that through His Son, Jesus Christ. Some of you need to continue that journey. I want to tell you one thing that I believe helped me in that journey. Why I had doubts, didn't tell anybody. How in the world are you going to tell at Lee University, Bible major? I don't think I believe this anymore. I didn't even tell my wife, who was my fiance at the time that I was struggling. Nobody knew but me. But there was one thing that helped me. I wanted to believe. I just didn't know if I could. Don't let your doubt cause you to turn from Jesus. Take your doubts to him. 
That's what John the Baptist did when he doubted. He said, go ask him, are you the one or did I make a mistake? He took his doubts to Jesus. Take your doubts to him and watch what he will do. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to talk to these wonderful students, faculty, staff, guests who are here today. I pray for the one hiding that this message let them know that you see them and you love them and you're pursuing them. I ask, Father, that the seeds of this message will bear fruit as your Holy Spirit intended it to. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless all of you. Great to be here. Amen. Do not forget your creator. In him you will find your purpose. Hey, we have a few things going on the next couple of days I want to make sure you're aware of. Tomorrow night at 6 o'clock at Alumni Park Culture Fest. Be a great time. Lots of great food there from different cultures. At the same time, volleyball in Walker Arena, 6 o'clock tomorrow night. Coach Andrea Hudson is going to be going for her 800th career win. I'm sure she'd love to see you out there supporting her. And then men's soccer will follow against Shorter tomorrow at 7. We also have another volleyball match on Saturday at 1. Uh, anybody here excited about Dorm Wars on Monday night at 8 o'clock? Hey, I look forward to seeing you there. It's going to be a blast. Uh, who knows who's going to win, but I look forward to seeing it all go down. I heard a word of knowledge down here, I think, but I'm not sure if it's accurate. All right. Hey, in chapel on Tuesday in here, uh, Reverend Jerry Madden, pastor at Praise Cathedral in Greer, South Carolina, and in Dixon Center, we'll be having a School of Religion chapel. Dr. Mark Walker will be speaking for that. Once again, please help me express our appreciation to Dr. Mike Chapman for the word that he brought to us today. And as Pastor Harper mentioned, it's great to have his wife Trudy and his son Shannon with us today. If you would, please stand with me, and let's close with the college benediction. Pray with me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Have a great afternoon.